uh, webinar. Uh, this uh, today's webinar is titled "Five G's Role in Reducing Carbon Emissions Over 1.6 Billion Tons by 2030." Um, so, in this webinar today, we'll be going through some of the output of a recent re piece of research that we did, looking at how 5G can play a role in reducing carbon emissions globally. And we'll also be looking at how technology and connectivity is already playing a role in, in specific applications that are enabling the future energy ecosystem today. So um, let's get started. We've got a great lineup with us today. Um, so there's myself, I'll be presenting and moderating the panel. Um, we've also got my colleague Matt, who will be presenting um, uh, some parts of the research specifically focused on the use cases uh, that 5G can enable and uh, what operators and other parts of the ecosystem can uh, can do to accelerate um, progress. And then we've got two, I guess, industry practitioners with us um, who are going to provide great insights. So we've got Charles from Smart Club, which is a, a community sort of initiative, which is um, enabling uh, decentralized energy ecosystems, and Phil from Octavus Energy, which is a, uh, a green energy supplier um, based in the UK. Um, and then last but not least, we have Ian, who supported us um, on the research in this, uh, from Huawei. So unfortunately, Ian's webcam is not working, but he is with us, and he'll be um, definitely involved in the panel discussion later on. So just a quick note on the agenda. Um, I've kind of gone through this already, but um, just to recap, I'll go through the usual housekeeping to start with and then dive into my presentation, uh, providing a bit of context of the framework and the thinking that we use to, um, to think through this problem of how 5G can reduce carbon emissions and uh, touch on why 5G is relevant. What are, what are the specific characteristics that um, will be useful? Uh, then, as I said, Matt will uh, deep dive into some of the output of the research that I mentioned, uh, looking at some of the use cases, um, some of the applications that already exist, and uh, a bit of a kind of a call to action in terms of next steps for the, the telecoms operators and the wider community. And then uh, we'll have these uh, five minute presentations from each of Charles and Phil, um, where they'll introduce uh, their companies um, more specifically and talk through a little bit or touch on a little bit how they're seeing the role of technology already today um, playing a part in their in their solutions and then we'll have the Q&A panel where Ian will get involved as well Matt, Phil and Charles um, and I'll be moderating that panel uh, so just quickly on the housekeeping um, I guess hopefully most of you are kind of aware of this um, if you've joined a webinar before, you should be able to see this control panel where we've got a screenshot on the right hand side. Um, if you can't quite see it, I think that button labeled one uh, should bring the control panel out. Uh, you are in listen only mode, so we can't hear you, but if you do have any problems, then just type in a question in the chat box. Anything related to audio issues, check the chat box. Um, we are taking questions throughout the the webinar as well. So do submit questions um, on the presentations or related to the topic more broadly in the question box. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the final thing, and I think the question that we always get asked early on is whether we'll share slides and recording. So we will share a link to the recording afterwards um, and the slides uh, shortly. Uh, we'll also be sharing a uh, the Q&A documented to the answer to the, the questions that you'll ask documented um, as a follow up in the next week or so too. Uh, just a quick note on the research so this uh, specific topic around the role of 5g in enabling you know the energy ecosystem and how it can play a role in reducing carbon emissions is part of a of, of a sort of wider 5g research series these are some of the other reports we've done in the last couple of years so do feel free uh, to check them out uh, one thing i would point out so t i guess today's uh discussion and webinar is more focused on how 5G can enable other industries to be more energy efficient and re to reduce carbon emissions. We have done a previous uh, piece of research on how the telcos themselves can be more um, sort of more carbon neutral and optimize how the networks are run to do so. Um, and that's that report curtailing carbon emissions can 5G help. So do check it out if you're interested in that specific topic. Um, one quick word then on the, the analysis and the modeling that we've done. So uh, Matt in particular will go through some of the output of uh, a modeling exercise we did to be able to quantify the impact of these 5G use cases on reducing global emissions. The general approach that we took and we've taken it with some of the other industry deep dives that we've done, it's a really a process of you know going through use cases, analyzing why 5G is, um, is beneficial and valuable over other 
connectivity technologies, um, building those use cases up in a bit more detail. Um, and then uh, the, the quantification, I guess, of the use cases and the value they bring, that a lot of the time is based on primary research. So we've done interviews with um, those within the energy industry and within telecoms more broadly. And also um, it's been informed by surveys with um, practitioners. So for this exercise in particular, we surveyed um, uh, energy sort of industry professionals in the generation side of things. So particularly those who are generating solar and wind, wind energy um, and other renewable energy sources um, on the transmission side and also uh, in, on the kind of supplier end as well. So trying to get a, a picture um, of the value chain end to end. And that's all kind of come together in a, in a modeling exercise where we forecasted base case carbon emissions and then evaluated um, the, the impact of 5G on top of that, that forecast um, until 2030. If you have any questions on the modeling as well, feel free to submit them or, or email us. Okay, so, um, so the first thing then to go into is uh, my presentation. So I'll be talking about uh, why 5G is relevant and as I said, setting the context a little bit. And um, I think probably for Phil and Charles, um, uh, a lot of this information is not new, but I think for some of us within the telecoms industry, it's useful to understand um, the real, the key mechanisms that are driving, they're going to, they are going to drive a reduction in carbon emissions. So um, the first thing I guess is to introduce this framework that we that we uh, came up with as we had to answer this key question of, you know, what are the use cases within the energy ecosystem that are going to need 5G? And then how are those use cases going to uh, make a difference when it comes to carbon emissions? And there are these, um, these three mechanisms. So I'll go through them one by, by one. The first thing is that we need to be able to uh, produce greener electricity. And m m a lot of that is going to be about um, increasing the proportion of um, energy that's uh, um, powering the electricity grid coming from renewable energy sources. So on the next slide, what you have here is a chart which um, is based on some analysis by sort of third party, um, uh, you know, energy focused analysts. And when, they, when they've kind of gone through the process of, of um, evaluating how the world is going to reduce its carbon emissions, how energy consumption is going to change, What's been seen as a, a as a key driver is um, first of all that you know electricity is going to grow um, uh, in a, in consumption adoption, but also that there will be a need for more of that energy to come from um, solar and wind in particular. So what you can see on the chart is today, you know, a very very tiny proportion of that is coming from solar and wind, but um, uh, we need that to, be, to to grow to over sort of 60% uh, of total. Um, uh, um, power on the electricity grid by 2050. So that's a huge change. So what that means is any, um, I guess, use case, anything that can nudge that, or that can accelerate the adoption of solar and wind um, on the grid uh, is going to be um, uh, valuable to be able to meet those carbon emissions targets. So that's the first thing. And you know, not news to most people, everyone understands the, the benefits of um, boosting renewable energy on the grid. The second thing is that will need to transition to electricity. And what that um, is mainly focusing on is moving away from, um, I guess, uses of energy, um, consumers of energy, applications, which are um, being powered by the by direct combustion of fossil fuels. So in other words, you know, the fact that we are using petrol to fuel our cars, and um, in some markets, at least, we, you know, they're still using fossil fuels for heat, uh, heat, um, heating homes, heating businesses, water heating, all that sort of thing. And you know, in a lot of markets, that's that's um, done by gas. Um, and just to, to, I guess, show the significance of this transition um, that that we'll need to do, and, and the reason why you know we need to transition to electricity is because it will become, you know, it's a greener source of fuel compared to the direct combustion of, of, um, of oil and gas. Taking the UK as an example, so you know we analyzed some data from 2018 looking at energy consumption across different uses. And what you can see here is just how much um, or how, how significant that transition um, from fossil fuel energy to electricity is going to be in these three key domains. So if you just, you know, just space heating, water heating and transport, if you compare that to total electricity consumption in the UK, um, I mean, space heating alone is significantly more than total electricity consumption. So you can imagine that 
that um, those shifting to electricity is going to be a, a huge issue. The other thing, though, or the other way to look at it, there is a, a big opportunity. So again, the UK is not it's it's not the same case in other markets. Some some markets are um, much further down the line in terms of using electricity, but at least in the UK there is a sort of a huge opportunity to, to make that transition because if you take um, transport, for example, about you know, less than 1% of that total energy consumption is coming from electricity today, which is not surprising because you know, we have low adoption of electric vehicles, but that needs to change going forward. So we need to think about how we can you know, use technology to enable mechanisms to aid that transition. The thing with transitioning to electricity though, is that it does come, does come with challenges. The first thing is just the sheer um, volume of um, demand that's going to that's going to be placed on the grid, um, and, and I guess you know Charles and Phil are, are very close to this, being you know quite close to say the the electricity um, supply side. Um, but what we just what we just saw in that that chart on the UK is just how much um, it's going to grow, grow exp exponentially, and you know the the networks that um, were built to distribute energy and to distribute electricity were designed to support a fairly linear model and were, to, were not designed to, um, I guess, be able to support the amount of um, electricity that will, it will need to support in the future. And um, in some ways, there are some similarities with, um, I guess, the telecoms networks where, you know, in telecoms, we are, we are also seeing a huge surge in data. And that's partly that surge in data is, is I guess, forcing a, a need to decentralize networks, to manage telecoms networks at a more local level. That same thing is happening um, in, uh, in the sort of the energy networks as well. And so there'll be, because of this, there'll be increasing need to decentralize the energy network and to manage it uh, more locally to be able to handle that huge surge in demand. Second thing is the variable supply of energy. So as we increase, particularly solar and wind, um, uh, their contribution to the electricity grid, um, you know, the, 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 unfortunately, we don't have sunny days all the time. Wind is also very variable. And so there isn't necessarily this, um, say, reliable supply of energy. That may change as um, there's, you know, great investment in storage mechanisms, but for now it, it is variable. And therefore, um, you know, we, we will have to move to a model where potentially demand needs to be much closer to supply. And actually, rather than um, take de demand as given and therefore supply must always match demand, it's the other way around. And so that's where things like um, the, I guess, this um, concept of demand shifting plays a part, where we want to create incentives for consumers and others to potentially um, change how they consume energy, change the time that they consume energy so that we don't overload the electricity grid. That can be done maybe through automated mechanisms. So inter internally, we've discussed things like you have a, a kind of a button on a washing machine. And I think that, I mean, it already exists to some degree. You click it and then sort of when, it, when it's appropriate during the day, the washing machine will only start running when, for example, um, there is sufficient uh, supply uh, on the grid. An alternative might be a more, um, you know, to provide incentives. Um, so being able to price um, electricity at a more uh, granular level and therefore you have price incentives so people will you know will um, indirectly shift demand because they'll want to be able to access um, electricity when it's at a lower price and then the third thing the third challenge with moving to electricity is is um, the stability of the grid um, so uh, we we need to I mean the electricity grid has a frequency that it needs to stabilize at and um, that frequency can be uh, can sort of be altered depending on um, if there's huge um, fluctuation in demand and supply. Um, with fossil fuels, we they were um, the way that you know fossil fuels run with turbines. They provided the inertia to be able to um, to stabilize the grid at at points where this, the frequency wasn't um, so stable. Uh, without with with this transition to renewable energy and moving away from fossil fuels, we'll need to think about new ways to stabilize the grid. Um, part of that might be about um, providing inertia in other ways, but the other thing, or what's happening right now at least, is that it will require a very responsive, uh, being very responsive on the demand side. So especially, you know, large consumers of energy, big industrials, businesses, even telecoms operators, um, they will need to be able to sort of switch off demand quite quickly to be able to um, 
to balance that frequency on the grid. So these are challenges that are, you know, they're not solved and they and they um, they need to be met. And there are there is a potential for technology to play a role because a lot of the time of this need to, you know, monitor data and to be able to change things in real time. Um, the next page really just, uh, I guess, is an illustration of this point around decentralized networks. I won't dwell on it for too long, but um, just to reiterate that there are, you know, there is a change, a kind of a, a, a change in how energy networks are, are, are designed, how the ecosystem will work, where there is a move towards decentralization and managing things at a much local level. And the thing to emphasize here is that, um, as I just said, it will require greater monitoring of both the demand side, the supply side, and being able to, um, to boost uh, supply or potentially decrease demand um, to balance the two out and do that in real time. And then the last, I guess, mechanism is energy efficient consumption. So um, this is really about being able to essentially, you know, reduce the amount of energy needed to do the same thing. So, this could be about avoiding the need to um, to use energy entirely. So, for example, you know, maybe things like using video calling to avoid the need to um, use your car to go somewhere or take a flight. Or it could be about just doing things more in a more efficient way. So, just being able to um, you know to have solutions that optimize energy or or, or make small tweaks um, to reduce um, that energy consumption. Okay. So the next, I mean, the, the thing then to switch on to is where does 5G fit into this? And Matt will go through this in more detail. Um, but the, um, I guess the thing to just touch on is what 5G, 5G's capabilities are. And I think most people on the webinar are probably aware of this being in the telecoms industry. And you know, we always talk about this idea that 5G is, is quite different to previous generations of um, mobile technology. It's not just about higher speeds, more bandwidth. Uh, it can, um, you know, one of its, I guess, key um, uh, benefits is the ability to enable low latency for certain applications. That's going to be critical for this idea of real-time decision making in the energy ecosystem. Being able to support um, IoT uh, devices um, uh, better than in pre than previous generations of mobile technology because of the capacity that and the number of devices that 5G can support. And also it's, um, you know, it, it's sort of more um, energy uh, efficient and puts less of a strain on the end devices as well so it can um, prolong their battery life. And that's, that's important when you have, uh, when you're talking about energy where you have devices or sensors on you know, infrastructure that's way out in the field and can't be changed very easily. Um, so, there are, so there are these capabilities. I guess in terms of how this relates to our framework, um, and again, um, Matt will talk through the use cases, but today, I guess in today's session, we are interested in this sort of indirect of 5G. So how 5G can enable new use cases that can support either the energy industry directly or um, or other industries to um, to be to be able to move to electricity or to be able to reduce their um, energy consumption. Um, there is also this you know this direct impact to how the telecoms operators and networks can be more energy energy efficient. We'll touch on that a little bit less today, but as I said, we we have a previous um, bit of research that um, that did go through that. So on that note, um, I guess the, the next question is, what are these use cases? So I'll hand over to Matt, who will take us through um, a bit more of the research and the outcomes of the modeling that we that we went through. Over to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Dahlia. So I think, as we all know, 5G really enables a very wide range of, of new use cases. But in this particular study, we narrowed in on eight use cases that we think can help the energy industry to ultimately reduce carbon emissions. So I'll run through a high level overview of these eight use cases and then we'll do a little bit of a deep dive on a couple of them. But I think before we get started, there's two important points to make. Firstly, we really did just focus on use cases within the energy industry. So there's a wide range of other 5G enabled use cases, I'm sure outside of the energy industry that will also help us to reduce carbon emissions, but they fell a little bit outside the scope of this particular project. And then the second point is that it's really important to evaluate the impact of these use cases at an aggregate level in order to see you know, a tangible impact on, on global carbon emissions. So there's no you know, one single killer use case. We evaluate the use cases together. So looking at the eight use cases from a high level, the first that we're going to look at is predictive maintenance. So this is actually a relatively mature use case in some sectors, I guess specifically manufacturing, but it involves monitoring assets and equipment 
in order to try and better predict when maintenance is going to be needed and hence reduce unplanned downtime. So we mostly looked at it with, with a focus on wind turbines. And if you reduce unplanned downtime, then not only are you increasing the amount of energy that can be produced, but you're also reducing operations and maintenance costs. So why does it need 5G? Well, the way that predictive maintenance works is by having hundreds of sensors all over an asset. And what 5G does with its potential for higher capacity than previous iterations of mobile networks, as Dahlia said, is allow us to connect more IoT devices to it. And it also provides a reliable connection. So the second use case, automated asset control, is actually very closely linked to the predictive maintenance in that it also works by having hundreds of sensors all over an asset. Then these sensors collect data and feed it into um, an analytics platform where maybe using digital twins and AI, we can control these assets and kind of automatically alter them to try and maximize output. So again, using the example of wind turbine, this might mean changing the direction of the turbine or the orientation of the blades to try and increase the output. So we need low latency in, in this instance to try and react to the conditions. And it's also important to have capacity as previously mentioned. So the next use case that we looked at was drone maintenance and repair. And drones can be really important in terms of reducing operations and maintenance costs because they really reduce the need to send out expensive field engineers. So this is particularly relevant for offshore wind farms where it's very expensive to send out field engineers all the time. But it's also relevant for maybe some remote onshore wind farms or for solar panel farms. And we've actually seen examples of deployments at many solar power farms already where they have drones that are equipped with infrared technology, which kind of scans and can find out where, where the faulty panels are. But you know, what does 5G bring that's different to this? Well, 5G would potentially enable the drones to actually carry out more of the repairs by themselves. It enables more autonomous navigation and beyond visual line of sight journeys. So it really does bring some new capabilities to, to what drones can do in this instance. And it requires high bandwidth and low latency for these kind of extra, these extra capabilities to, to be fulfilled. The fourth use case that we looked at was perimeter protection. So this is quite simple. It's just about monitoring the environment around the wind farm to try and avoid any damage from, from a third party. So the first thought of this is it could be drones, but we actually encountered some instances where protected bird species had flown into wind turbines and this had you know, resulted in big environmental fines for, for the wind farm operators. Then the fifth use case is a digitally assisted field engineer. So this just means supporting field engineers with more digital technology. And we think it would mostly take, take the form of AR, VR helmets. So these not only increase the efficiency of the actual maintenance trips themselves, but hopefully will reduce the number of maintenance trips that need to be taken. And these helmets would require low latency and high bandwidth to operate properly. So these first five use cases are all fairly concentrated on the actual generation plants. But the last three are really quite different. So location-based battery supply. This is about creating a, a highly connected vehicle and road infrastructure, which would be able to support an electric vehicle battery swapping network and really try and avoid the, the long waiting times that we often associate with, with electric vehicles. So location data and AI would track demand for all of the batteries. And then we would try and optimize both the storage and the supply across the entire network. So the capability of 5G that is different here to the previous use cases is that we need mobility as well as low latency and capacity to handle the large number of devices. The penultimate use case that we looked at is energy demand and supply management. So this encompasses lots of different applications to help consumers, businesses, even municipalities to try and you know, use energy more efficiently and overall reduce their, reduce their carbon emissions. So we need real time data to, to feed into analytics platforms and tell us you know, when should we consume energy? When should we run certain applications to, to consume energy? And even when can consumers sell energy back onto the grid and become prosumers? So we need 5G again for high capacity to monitor lots of devices and also for reliability. So there's a lot of companies doing innovative things already in this space. And we're going to hear from, from one of those, Octopus Energy, uh, later in the presentation. But we really think 5G can enhance what, what goes on already. And the final use case that we looked at is smart grid load balancing. With a, de with a more decentralized grid, uh, like Dahlia mentioned earlier, and with more renewable energy on the grid, we need much better balancing of, of demand and supply, as she highlighted. So this use case involves connecting different sources of energy supply, energy generation, and the end users to kind of try and dynamically turn things on and off and balance demand and supply. 
So this needs real-time predictive models on a large scale and to try and keep all of this balance in demand and supply. And it requires low latency, reliability, and capacity again. So on the next slide, we try and have a look at, you know, which capabilities of 5G are these use cases actually drawing from? And I think the first thing, well, the thing that you really note when you look at it is that most of them are kind of clustered in the middle, indicating that they actually rely on several of 5G's capabilities. I think maybe the exception being perimeter protection, which is mostly reliant on low latency. But we can also see you know, which capabilities we were really looking into when we were investigating which use cases to take on and low latency, device density and data volume and ultra reliability and security were the main things that we identified. So the first use case or use cases that we're gonna take a bit more of a deep dive on are, are the closely connected automated asset control and predictive maintenance. So they both, they both rely on hundreds of sensors all over, the, all over the asset. So in this case, mostly wind turbines, and they collect data not just on the weather, but on the condition of the asset as well. And as highlighted, 5G really increases the number of sensors that can be, that can be connected. It also makes sure we're gonna get this data reliably and that actually we can place sensors on the hard to, hard to reach and fast sort of moving bits of, bits of the wind turbine. This data is then fed into an analytics platform and in the case of predictive maintenance, the data could be sent to the, the maintenance teams in order to put the predictive maintenance processes in place, or it could also be sent to supply chain partners. So if we were able to make sure that any replacement parts arrived in time, then it just further reduces any unplanned downtime and increases the output of a wind farm. In the case of automated asset control, we actually conducted a survey and we found out that 75% of solar power generators and 62% of wind power generators said that having the ability to automatically control their assets in response to conditions would increase the annual output by up to 10%. So this is clearly a very significant positive impact on renewable energy production. Most of the use cases that we had looking at generation plants were actually targeting operations and maintenance costs. So as we can see from, from this diagram, they're very significant. For offshore wind, operations and maintenance costs take up 28% of the entire lifetime cost of the farm. And for solar, this is 16%. So in reducing operations and maintenance costs, there's gonna be a clear positive impact on the competitiveness of the farm. And then if we combine this with some of the use cases that actually increase the output of the farm, then I think we can be fairly sure that, this, that these use cases could accelerate the adoption of renewable energy. And when we conducted our modeling, um, our modeling activity, this is what we found. So if you think about it, when you're actually building renewable energy plants, if they're more compelling financially than the alternatives, even without the subsidies, this is going to incentivize the investment in, in, in this particular sector. So when we modeled it, we found out that wind by 2030 would take up a 0.3% higher proportion of electricity on the grid than in the non-5G case. And this figure would be 0.6% for solar. The next use case that we're gonna take a little bit more of a deep dive on is smart grid load balancing, which is actually made up of a number of, of sub use cases. If we want these micro energy generators to actually sell back onto the grid, then we need aggregators who can bundle up the smaller suppliers into a big enough block that we can sell it into the grid. And companies like Smart Club, who we'll hear from um, in a moment, they do this by consolidating energy from households or small businesses, small offices, schools, and something else that we can do is create a virtual power plant. So this would connect all assets to the market and then be able to conduct transactions actually on their behalf. This would clearly require a highly reliable, low latency connection that, that 5G can provide to actually monitor the assets in real time. For, for actually balancing capacity, we obviously need good predictors of supply and demand for energy, but also an ability to automatically scale generation or consumption up and down. We can do this currently, but nowhere near to the real time that there is growing demand for, and this is where 5G can step in. And then the final sub use case, another one that Dahlia briefly touched on earlier is frequency response. So now that thermal power plants are playing less of a role, it is harder to maintain the inertia required to maintain the target frequency of the grid. But short-term management of demand and supply is absolutely key for making sure we therefore avoid damaging fluctuations in, in frequency. So it's critical that we not only predict these fluctuations, but also are able to trigger any mitigating actions instantly. And again, the low latency, um, the low latency potential of 5G is, is, is critical here. So the point that I highlighted earlier, and it's important to reiterate, is that these use cases should be, um, should be evaluated, the impact of these use cases should be evaluated at an aggregate level. 
and this is when we see a tangible effect on carbon emissions. So these use cases actually spread across all three mechanisms that Dahlia mentioned earlier. And here we have, I guess, one of the main outputs from, from our modeling exercise, which shows the divergence in global carbon emissions between the 5G case and the base case. So we can deduce that the gap between the two is the impact of, our five, of all of our 5G, um, 5G use cases. So as we can see, by 2030, there is an annual difference of 254 megatons of CO2 globally, which is equal to approximately 64 coal-fired power plants in one year. This gap as well, we, we would only expect it to grow as obviously more countries are able to support 5G in the first place. But also as these use cases we, we've touched on today are able to develop and as we discover you know, more new 5G enabled use cases. But I guess the next question that we should be asking is what does this all mean and what are the next steps, not just for the energy industry, but for telecoms operators as well. And we tried to identify seven next steps that we thought it would be important to take note of across the technology industry, across governments, and of course, of course, the telecoms industry as well. So starting by looking at, at technology, the first point is that we need to ensure there is access to 5G in the right places. So we've often found that there's a discrepancy between clearly where your wind and solar farms are and where, and where people live, but we need to build 5G where there's industrial demand. And this, in some instances, might involve, um, the, uh, it might involve private 5G networks instead. Another point that falls under this first bracket is that we need to avoid any delay of 5G rollout. And in the previous STL study that, that Dahlia um, mentioned earlier, we actually found out that an accelerated rollout of 5G will, will um, result in reduced carbon emissions. The second point is that we should leverage the unique benefits of network slicing. So network slicing is one of the fundamental and absolutely unique capabilities of 5G that really sets it apart from previous generations of mobile, mobile connectivity. And it means we can provide tailored 5G solutions to different customers. So if we take the example of energy, we could have one slice which had mission critical connections to try and manage frequency response. This would clearly need to be highly reliable. But then we could have another slice which mostly managed electric vehicles and this would need to have high mobility. Looking at the role of government, point number three is that the government should consider the role of technology in parallel with carbon emissions policy. So many governments and some better than others have supported renewable energy very well through subsidies. But we think it's important as well to actually consider, um, consider take a more holistic approach and include the role of technology when looking at carbon emissions policy. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, maybe with this, you could, when looking at 5G coverage targets, instead of having population focused targets, have targets which focus on where low carbon energy generators are actually situated. Point number four is that we should streamline infrastructure planning across telecoms and energy networks. So both telecoms and energy actually, they share something in common in that they both require vast physical network infrastructure, but it's not always easy to deploy them quickly as a result but better planning can really streamline this process. So a really great example of this is that in 2018, Deutsche Telekom converted 12,000 street cabinets into electric vehicle charging ports. Then point number five, looking at telecoms. So what the telcos really need to do is begin to apply some of their learnings from internal telco and networks transformations to the energy industry. So experience, for example, in data analytics. So moving from managing customer data to using real-time data to optimize network performance. Especially as the energy networks become more decentralized, I think as well, they'll need to move towards more of an NFB or kind of SCN type model and the telcos can certainly apply their, apply their learnings here as well. Point number six is to become more active players in the decentralized energy ecosystem. So a decentralized energy ecosystem by its nature is gonna have multiple stakeholders, but the telcos are in a really great position to actually drive this, to actually drive this forward by making use of their pre-existing relationships, not just with public bodies, but with enterprises as well. And they could bring together consumer propositions that include connectivity, devices, applications, data insights, and even services. Then the seventh next step and the final next step is to develop appropriate monetization models. And we took a little bit more of a closer look at this now. Many operators still have relatively nascent enterprise businesses, which are more focused on selling SIMs or charging for megabyte. But actually at STL, we think to really stimulate 5G demand requires offering a bit more than just the traditional connectivity services. And we identified three high level business models that telcos should consider. 
the first of this, the first of these is solutions and applications. So providing tailored end-to-end -end solutions for customers. This might include consulting, it might include systems integration, it might include the application themselves. So there have been a couple of early movers. For example, AT&T have been working with Redaptive to produce a efficiency as a service solution. And then Telefonica have their eco-smart energy efficiency solutions as well. The second high-level business model is application enablement. This means bringing together applications and data from multiple different partners and then bringing them to users. So this could be data management applications, billing or transactional, but it could even be creating an app marketplace. So looking at Octopus Energy, again, who, who we'll hear from shortly, maybe what telcos could do for them is to create APIs that really enable real-time decisions on buying and selling electricity. And the final high-level business model that we looked at is networks as a service. So managing custom networks in a cloud-like way. But again, thinking, um, thinking of energy, we know that wind and solar, they're, they're in remote locations, they need more security. So changing the business model so that they're more orientated towards private networks. And this, of course, would require new skills for many operators. So these are the three high-level business models that we think telcos should consider. Thanks, Matt. And I think that's, um, that's great to tee us up for uh, Charles's presentation, because we've just been started to talk about new business models. So um, in the interest of time, Charles, I'll hand over to you. One thing I will say is if anyone does have any questions, um, we've had a couple come in, but feel free to ask them in the, in the questions box, and we'll, uh, we'll try and address them in the panel discussion. Over to you, Charles. Thank you, Dahlia. So I'm Charles Bradshaw Smith from Smart Club, and I think my first slide is about to appear. Thank you. Um, so what we're all about is enabling communities to play a full role in the climate emergency. Now, most initiatives are top-down initiatives, government-led, or at best council-led, or major industry players who are often large uh, energy consumers. Um, they're motivated by their own actions, but actually, if we're to solve the climate emergency, it's you and I, as normal consumers, leading our busy lives that need to get involved. And that's our mission, is to create a set of services that allow us to act as a trusted intermediary between ordinary people and the industry. And I'm sure if uh, Matt's slides have con convinced you of anything, it's that uh, building a smart grid is a complex thing, um, but without consumers adopting uh, receptive behaviours, and as you will see, without technology like 5G, it, it isn't going to happen. So the bit of the iceberg in the climate emergency that we really need to solve is a bit under the water, um, and that relies on communities. So that's what we're all about, and we're business model innovators. The technology is fantastic. Um, we're not going to uh, fail to solve the climate emergency because the low tech isn't there. We are going to fail because putting it all together into something that makes sense for society is very complicated and making it play um, appropriately in the energy system. And that's because the legacy of the energy system is about huge industry and huge economies of scale. So every time you take a breath in the energy industry, the fixed cost of doing so is very, very high. And this, this is the theme of where I think 5G can really help. Let me go on and explain the two projects we're involved with. So Trent Basin in Nottingham, uh, we have built a living laboratory um, for community energy here. Uh, this project isn't finished, we're kind of halfway through it, um, and we've got some new funding, uh, which is very exciting for us to take the next stage. So effectively, what we're doing with a real developer, um, as well as with real communities of people, we are embedding renewables and storage into the low uh, voltage grid. We're connecting the communities and we're adding value both to the communities by providing them with low carbon energy, but also by helping support the grid. Um, and Dahlia said, uh, alluded to demand side response type mechanisms. And at the moment, these have mostly uh, revolved around avoiding making matters worse. So Economy 7 is a great example. It incentivizes you to stop using your energy at peak times um, and move that load into nighttime when, when there's less of a peak. And that's very helpful, but really 
um, until Octopus's Agile tariff came out, and then Phil can talk to you about that, uh, there wasn't anything that much more sophisticated. Um, and what we need to do is to shift uh, away from uh, communities response just being avoiding making peaks worse to being actually active sponsors of helping support the frequency for instance so we're earning revenues in this community by frequency response and, uh, as a, uh, amongst other things and essentially unless we get the grid smart uh, to do that kind of thing we there is no chance that we can accommodate all the growth in electrification from electric vehicles and from heat pumps uh, knocking out petrol and gas as fossil fuels without a really active grid and without active communities. And ultimately, we've got to get this right down to the in-home appliance level. Um, and again, a legacy of the energy industry is that the cost of switching things on and off is so high at the moment that only huge loads um, actually participate whereas if we can get in-home appliances and of course there are tens of millions of these across the country we can have a very accurate statistical understanding of how to switch these things on and off at the right time that it's a very stable and fruitful model but it does require high connectivity um, so we are hoping that 5g allows the internet of things to be ubiquitous uh, and that ultra low latency, as Matt's already alluded to, gives us some valuable responses. The faster you can respond with an energy asset, the more valuable it is to that community. And we want these in thousands of homes. And very quickly, if we, my final slide uh, talks about our project in Milton Keynes, where we're part of the citywide 5G. Uh, project there and we're helping build a data hub with a number of uh, uses community energy is obviously our biggest focus and how can we use things like drone technology to fly over parts of the city understand using um, technology to measure the heat and the uh, potential of rooftops of, for insulation etc build that into a map and then get communities to work together to bulk buy those services to retrofit their homes we're doing things like that we're also involved in the project of things like autonomous vehicles which obviously uh, need 5g um, as well all the way down to what you might consider more mundane things like controlling ventilation um, to benefit health with air quality and again you'll see a theme here this requires lots of iot uh, ultra low latency uh, and we need to get those uh, 5G uh, devices into public realm assets as well as uh, in the appliances at home. So we have great hopes for, for 5G. That's it from me. Thanks, Charles. And then we'll do a smooth transition to Phil to do your uh, your intro as well. Great. Thank you, Dahlia. Uh, Matt, Charles, very interesting presentations. Thank you. Matt, can you give me the next slide? Uh, and the next one. So, my name is Philip Steele. I'm the Future Technologies Evangelist at Octopus Energy. It's a bit of a grand title. In fact, some people refer to it as the best title in the energy industry. What that means is that I head up a lot of our innovation and research projects. So, I'm just going to touch on a couple of those as I go through the slides. Uh, and as Charles has already mentioned the Agile Tariff uh, as one example. So, next one, Matt. So, this is kind of like a, a summary of slide of what we see in the domestic space around what we call smart energy. So, if we look at the smart meter, which is in the center of the diagram there. Um, that's where it all starts for us as to how we manage smart, intelligent tariffs in the home. Um, that gives us 30 minute data of, of uh, the energy consumption in the home. Um, and that allows us then to do things, whether it's with storage, so battery systems, um, solar generation, electric heat. Um, so as Dali had in her slides there, electrification of things in the home is becoming important to move, trying to move away from gas and other fossil fuels. Um, and, and then electric cars fit into that as well. So as well as Octopus Energy, there's a sister company, Octopus Electric Vehicles, and we sell and lease um, electric cars as well, which is really important for the electrification of, um, of homes. Um, now, when you put together that combination of things in the home, appliances as well as Charles mentioned, then how do we get that energy to the home from the grid? Um, how do I share my energy with other homes? So kind of peer-to-peer -peer trading type scenarios. Um, and where's my renewable energy come, come from? Um, 
and what you can see there is this is all around data and control APIs and Kraken. Kraken is our IT platform that we've built from scratch um, that enables us to do really smart tariffs and clever things with smart meters, data, control, APIs and things. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. So one of those is the, the Agile tariff. Now, um, the wholesale market in the energy industry is, is uh, energy suppliers are buying energy usually on about a 12 month basis ahead for somebody on a regular flat rate tariff. But actually there's also the day ahead market um, and that's where energy is, is priced per half hour of the day according to what the forecast demand is and what the forecast generation is. So on very windy days and lots of strong solar days, we will see the wholesale market actually dip quite significantly. Between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m., the wholesale market is actually very high. So we created this tariff called Agile that tracks that wholesale market and provides that straight through to consumers. So consumers now become aware of what the energy market is doing. Um, so in this screenshot here from middle of August, um, you can see that the Agile price was down six, seven, eight pence. Um, that's very low compared to a normal flat rate tariff of about 15 pence or so. But the opposite of that is that between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m., the price is is, is 25 to 35 pence per kilowatt hour. And what we've seen is customers have used this and have started to decide how to use energy and how to use assets that I had on the previous slide in clever and smart ways. Um, and there's APIs therefore that are connected to this. And a lot of things has now started to be connected to it to charge electric cars at the cheapest time of day, um, to um, run heating systems at cheapest times of day and things like this. Now that wholesale price actually affects the, the, uh, the wholesale market, which is therefore very driven by renewable energy, as we see renewable energy becoming very distributed, but also very intermittent. Um, so strong um, wind days and strong solar days. Can you give me the next slide, Matt? Um, so one of the uh, impacts of that is that when we have very strong wind, we actually have negative days, uh, and we call that plunge pricing. So customers on this tariff, when there is excess wind generation, the, the wholesale market actually reflects that as a negative price. The, 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 the grid is trying to shift that supply and get it consumed by anybody that consumed that energy and will actually go negative. And so you can see here, customers are sharing this on, on Twitter, that they're gonna get um, credited by us for consuming energy when we have those negative events. Um, we had one, the last one was about uh, two weeks ago on, um, on a Sunday afternoon. It actually went as low as nine, minus nine pence per kilowatt hour um, in the north of Scotland, the various up and down the, uh, down the country. Uh, and that's really interesting that we're now encouraging customers to consume rene renewable energy with these sorts of tariffs. Next one, Matt. Um, and that's all based on the smart meter. And obviously the, the smart meter requires connectivity. Uh, if you give me the next one. Um, and that's where then I look at the, at the role of 5G for us in the energy industry. Now, I would like to see more of those devices and appliances and things connected. What I'm seeing at the moment when I look at, um, this is Telefonica's website around 5G, is more of a focus on um, uh, mobile phones and tariffs and uh, around that, some of the points covered in the previous presentations around latency and uh, bandwidth and so on. And those are kind of less of a requirement for us at the moment with the sorts of things that we're doing. We're measuring half hour data and we're charging customers for use of that de of their energy per half hour. And we're not quite into a real time or a high, high um, bandwidth or a low latency requirement. Next slide. Pat. So, what I kind of see as well is alongside that bandwidth and latency is actually the 5G coverage is still relatively limited. And I, I see that the operators are claiming fairly small areas of, of coverage, at the moment, mostly around towns and cities. Uh, and that becomes a problem for us as an energy supplier because we have to provide smart meters um, to pretty much every domestic property um, and, and small business in, in the UK. And so we're very reliant on um, high coverage. Um, so I don't think 5G is quite there yet for us, um, but, it, it, but it will be in the future as we get more of that connectivity. And the next one, Matt. So I think I covered some of this as I was talking about 5G at the beginning there, around that low latency, faster speed, um, video conferencing, AR, VR. In the way in which we are selling energy, those sorts of aspects of 5G are not yet required, but actually it's more about the, the coverage that's more important to us. Um, the other thing I wanted to just note as well on that um, earlier diagram I showed of the, of the house is that 
it's actually very fragmented technology at the moment and each of the appliances in that picture so whether it's a battery inverter or a vehicle charger or even a, a v2g charger as well um, and some of the smart home appliances are all using different communications methods so they either have their own mobile connectivity or they're relying on the uh, the wi-fi and the home broadband network to provide connectivity back um, and that kind of fragmentation i i, I hope can be solved by um, 5g in the future i think that was my last slide matt give me the last slide Okay, well, thanks, Phil. So we've got about um, ten minutes left for this for the panel for the for the Q and A. I think you've you've actually teed us up uh, quite well, Phil, for um, at least one of the questions that have come in. Um, and I think the first thing I, I want to bring Ian in because he's been patiently uh, waiting on the side there. So one of the questions we have is, um, uh, you know, do you agree that ninety percent of these use cases can be delivered via four G or other connectivity means? Um, so I suppose you know another way to put it in is you know what what where do you see 5G playing a, a very specific unique role in the energy ecosystem? I think uh, thanks, Dana, and hello everyone. Uh, apologies for not being uh, on uh, the video. My camera doesn't want to connect to the system. Um, yeah, I think I think the issue about this is to me, and I've always felt this in the in the comms industry, that it's it's about horses for courses. Yes. You know, today some of the use cases could be done with 4G, but they're not being done with 4G. I think there's um, an opportunity to use the newer, faster uh, technologies um, to broaden the scope of the coverage of the uh, of the country. And you might want to do that because uh, when we talked about Matt talked about. Um, you know, the large volume of um, sensors on various devices, and uh, and so did um, so did Phil. Um, potentially, you know, if you're going to get a large volume of devices all trying to talk to the network at any one time, that starts to stress the network. Well, 5G can handle you know huge volumes, uh, you know, a million devices per square kilometer, and so there's an opportunity there. But I think the real answer to all this is that you have to scope out um, an end-to-end -end solution and you have to use the right technology in the right place. And I think in a lot of places when we've been discussing this, uh, this um, uh, set of um, uh, analysis, 5G has been the right answer. But equally well, there could be some opportunities for 4G and indeed, in, in, indeed Wi-Fi. Um, and I think, you know, as our uh, demand for bandwidth, the insatiable demand for bandwidth, the in, in, insatiable demand for higher speeds and lower latency works through, we'll find 5G being um, the leading technology there, um, as well as the fact that, you know, it's a very secure technology, more secure than others. Um, it's a very uh, important um, technology from the point of view of mobility and reliability. Um, and also, as I, as I mentioned, really the capability it has for the density. Uh, I think that's where, it'll, where you'll see um, 5G really being pushed. Okay, thank you. And I guess you, you see, touched on this point around there, there are some technological, I guess, challenges. And, and Phil touched on this idea that we need coverage as well. That's one of the key, actually one of maybe the, the other barriers around leveraging connectivity for solutions today. Um, but the other, yeah, the other thing you talked about was kind of these, this idea of end-to-end -end solutions or changing business models. Um, so I wanted to get um, maybe Charles, your view on this, because you know you, you are the business model innovator. So to what extent do you feel that, so this is a question from the audience, to what extent do you feel that the commercial models are in place to support the investment needed for the 5G enabled energy saving solutions? So, you know, what, and what are some of those com commercial models, I guess, that you're exploring? Um, well, first thing to say, is, you know, I'm not a telco expert, so um, uh, I'm dealing in energy business models, uh, but nevertheless, I have a keen interest <laughs> in this topic. Um, and I think um, the kind of pay-as-you-go approach um, for telco uh, might need to be revisited. In the energy world, uh, most energy assets have an expected lifetime of 20 to 25 years uh, in the built environment, um, and you want to be want to have a very predictable uh, revenue and cost structure for that time. 
um, yes, the value moves up and down the energy value chain, um, but you don't want anything too unpredictable. So perhaps uh, we ought to start thinking about having business models where the connectivity um, and uh, the data transmission uh, is built into the asset cost for life. Um, you know, that would make me happy and make things uh, a lot simpler. Um, so that would be one example. Um, and then, then we've got predictable behavior. Um, I think um, also um, the, the idea of turning everything into a variable cost um, needs to be encouraged. I know the telco industry has gone a long way doing that. Uh, as mobile telephonies come in anyway, but if it goes the extra mile and makes everything a variable cost, I think adoption in the kind of speed that Matt referred to is far more possible um, than if there's always a, a, a large uh, upfront cost or fixed cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And there's, I mean, there's another question that's kind of related to this where the person said, it's great to have a network, but there's an entire ecosystem of organizations that have to make the move. You know, if they want to adopt 5G, that might be from other cellular technologies, 3G or 4G, or it might be from LoRaWAN or Wi-Fi, whatever it might be. And so the question is, why would, you know, for example, why would a smart energy monitor hardware manufacturer invest in the design of a new 5G enabled device when the cost is, is higher than other solutions? Um, so, Phil, I'd like to get your, you know, your answer to that question, and all, but also a little bit of, you know, your experience with you are working with connectivity and how you've sort of thought through this question around business model. Because, I guess, you are serving consumers, but at the same time, you, you know, you have a, a sort of a full ecosystem approach. You're working with companies like Tesla, um, smart charging, um, kind of cables, all that sort of thing. So, it'd be good to hear your views on on how you provide incentives for those other parties as well. Yep. So. Um... If you look at the current connectivity, it's uh, I think the, the smart meters have got 3G in two parts of the country on the Telefonica network, and then it's the Arkiva wide area network in the north. So um, already there's a non-cellular technology that's being used for the for the smart meter infrastructure. Um, I, I think because I, I'm, I'm focusing more on the domestic um, side of things, and pretty much wherever we're putting, uh, so you referenced there the Tesla tariff. So so that's um, a tariff available to customers with a Tesla Powerwall and a Tesla car and um, the headline rate is eight pence import and eight pence export which again is very low compared to a 16 pence um, tariff. That um, proposition manages the battery in such a way to even out and, and avoid the times when we're paying more for electricity on the wholesale market so that four to seven period that I mentioned. Now the customer is getting the benefit of the Tesla service through their tariff and it's only possible if we can reach that battery so it's in the customer's interest to ensure that that battery system and their um, vehicle charging and so on stays online so in those cases we're quite happy relying on the home network um, with the power wall connected over Wi-Fi and we will see fairly quickly if um, if you change your broadband provider you change your setup you know your um, broadband access box and so on and, and the Wi-Fi means this changed and that device needs to be reconnected again and so we're kind of less worried about the reliability and the performance of that um, connection with those sorts of assets because it's in the customer's interest to, to maintain the connectivity of that. Um, there's other similar scenarios so um, there's uh, a research project run by a uh, social housing uh, organization called Together Housing in uh, Lancashire They've installed 250 battery and solar systems on um, some of their properties. Now, in those cases, they have put a 4G dongle onto each of the inverters to avoid the necessary revisits if the social tenants are um, changing their Wi-Fi connections and things, uh, because you're now starting to talk about a large scale that's managed by the housing provider rather than for the consumer's benefit. The consumer has little interest in the technology that's been put in that because they're getting lower energy prices instead. So now it varies from one use case to um, another, what, what connectivity is used where and who who the consumer, the customer is. The customer is either that social housing provider or it's the end consumer in, in, the, uh, in the property. Mm. Yeah, so it's interesting, I guess, how yeah, the value proposition changes depending on which user or which, I guess, model that we're looking at. 
That is interesting. Um, Matt, I, I know that, um, I mean, you, you kind of took us through a few use cases, and I guess um, some of them we haven't touched in so much, you know, around helping sort of the, gen, the wind solar generation side and a few others. Um, on those, I mean, do you see that there are some barriers, potential barriers to adoption, what they might be, how we might overcome those? Yeah, so I think the, maybe the main barrier to, to lots of the wind and, and solar generators, has, it's kind of been touched on a little bit already. Um, and it's, I think the discrepancy between where the population lives and where the, we have actually the generators located and where there is industrial demand and this discrepancy in general between where industry is located and where people actually live. And at the moment, as I kind of touched on in, in the potential next steps, often the coverage targets are, are looking at where populations live and actually with 5G as you kind of touched on at the beginning of your presentation it's not just about high speeds There's, it has all of these other capabilities which I think are much more useful at least at the moment um, for industrial applications than they are for, for regular consumer applications and especially with offshore wind farms for example but also the particularly remote onshore wind farms or, or solar panel farms it's not that likely that they're going to be covered by, by they're not going to get public coverage you know anytime soon necessarily so i think in these instances this is when you've got to look at private 5g as, as being a potential kind of answer and uh, i think going back to one of the points that ian made in his first response one of the benefits of, of 5g over 4g is this high security and this is also one of the reasons why private 5g is a particularly good um, solution for, for wind farms and, and for solar farm operators and when we actually spoke to, to some uh, wind, wind, farm, um, wind farm operators as part of our research program this was something they particularly highlighted uh, you know the reason that their connectivity is so poor and the reason that uh, the field engineers don't have digital technology available to them is that Wi-Fi is not secure enough they don't have public 4G coverage and in this instance, I think that you know private 5G solutions could could be a good could be uh, the right answer for them. Okay, so it sounds quite complicated for a say for a telco operator looking at solutions. There are, I mean, there are pockets where 5G can play a role, but it's you know it's not a kind of one size fits all um, approach. Great. Well, I know that we've gone over time, um, and apologies for cutting the the panel discussion short. Um, we will be getting everyone's views to the. Uh, to answer your questions that you've submitted. I know there's been a quest, a few specific ones on the role of 5G in enabling more energy efficient networks as well as you know other industries. So we'll, we'll look at answering those as well as some of the others that came in. But I really wanna thank um, the panelists, um, so Phil, Charles, Matt and Ian um, off webcam uh, for joining. Thanks so much for your presentations and uh, yeah, look forward to uh, continuing the dis discussion offline. Thanks a lot guys. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye.